Welcome to Latin with Andy Code Breakers. In lesson two, we're going to be talking about how nouns work in Latin. First, let's do a little bit of review on how nouns work in English and look at this example here. Drake's sister gave him a pencil with an eraser. Remember first, to find the subject or nominative, we find the action, which in this case is gave. All right, then who is doing the action? Is it Drake's or is it sister? Well, we can kind of see that sister is the one doing the action, not Drake's. And you can also see that little clue that helped, that apostrophe that shows us that Drake's is actually going to be that big possessive noun adjective or what we like to call genitive in Latin. And so that is going to be possessing sister instead of actually doing the action. All right, let's continue. So sister gave what? Did sister give him or did the sister give a pencil? Well, it makes more sense to say that the sister gave him a pencil, right? So pencil is the direct object. Well, what does that make him? Him is actually going to be the indirect object. Remember, we talked about how indirect object and direct object are kind of like brothers. Him is indirectly receiving the action of the giving. Now, all we have left is one more noun, eraser. What is that? Well, you can kind of see a little help there. Remember, we try to point out those prepositions first. We see with is a preposition, which would make eraser the object of the preposition, or ablative, as we like to call it. In lesson one, you learned three things you need to know about nouns. Let's review. First, we had gender, which could either be masculine, feminine, or neuter. And then there was number, singular or plural, and then we talked about all the different cases or jobs that nouns can have. We have nominative, which is the subject, genitive, which are those possessive noun adjectives, and then we have dative, the indirect object, and his brother, accusative, the direct object, and then finally, ablative, the object of the preposition. Make sure you memorize these things. All right, we're getting really close to translation, but we're not quite there yet. First, we have to practice an essential part of translation, which is called identification. To identify something means to find all possible forms of a noun, meaning finding its gender, number, and case. Right now, we're just going to practice finding its number and its case for three, these three nouns right here. So let's see if we can get in some practice. Let's see if we can find the gender, number, and case of all three of these nouns. In the first declension, when it comes to gender, Mostly, first declension nouns are feminine, so that makes it pretty easy on us. However, there's one exception. Whenever a noun names a job or occupation, then it's actually going to be masculine instead. So let's keep an eye out for that. Our first word is agricolam. Looking at that ending, the red there, om, what is it? its gender, number, and case? Well, first of all, let's check the meaning to see whether or not it's going to be feminine or masculine. Agricola means farmer, and that is actually naming a job or occupation, so agricola is going to be mascul masculine. So, looking at our endings and our chart, our key, right, we see that om um, in the singular accusative. So our form here is going to be masculine, singular, accusative. Alright, let's try porta. We see the ending there, that a with that little line above it, that's called a macron. Paying attention to that line is important because it's a little piece of code that shows us the difference between this ending and the nominative singular. If you look at first declension endings, they're pretty similar. It's just that little line, or a macron, as that's what it's called, that tells them apart. Let's check the meaning of this word real quick to see whether or not it's feminine or masculine. Well, porta just means gate. Gate is not a job, so that means that porta is going to be feminine. So our ending here is feminine, and then what's the number? While well, checking that A with the macron above it, looking at our key, we see that it's going to be singular and ablative. So feminine, singular, ablative. Great. Last word, natarum. So arum is our big ending. Thankfully, it's not very hard to find on our key. Let's check its gender. Nata means sailor. Sailor, once again, is another occupation. So this one is, again, going to be masculine. So this ending is going to be masculine, now looking at our key, we see that it is plural genitive. See, so identifying forms is really not too hard at all. 
And now it's time for translating from Latin to English, otherwise known as breaking the code. Here are the steps that we take when we want to crack the code translating a Latin sentence. First, we are just going to take it one word at a time and do the identification thing that we just did. Identify the gender number in case of all of our nouns. And then we're going to check our verb. So don't worry, there's not a whole lot we're going to be identifying on our verbs. We're just going to be making sure that the subject and the verb match in number. Because in Latin, verbs have number. So the subject of your sentence has to match in number. So that's a little key for us to help us uh, translate these sentences. So let's look at the first sentence. Poeta why det? So poeta, we look at the ending, which is that a, ah, and then we find its gender, number, and case. Poeta means poet, which actually was an occupation, so this is going to be masculine. And then looking at our key, we see it's singular and nominative. Okay. So here's how we tell what number a verb is going to be. We look at the very end, at the ending, at the same thing, kind of like nouns, and then we check to see whether or not it's the letter T, <laughs> or if it's an NT. If it's just a T, then it's going to be singular. If it's an NT, then it's plural. So there's your little key for that. So looking at this word, why det, we see a T, which means it's singular. So let's see if the subject and the verb match in number. And looking at our gender number in case of poeta, they match, which means that poeta is actually doing the action of the verb. Why det means he, she, it sees. So we will replace the he, she, it with poet. So the translation of this sentence is going to be, the poet sees. Pretty easy, right? Let's do another one. Natai teram wident. Uh-oh, it's a little bit longer, but I think we can handle it. Our first word here is natai. All right, so the ending is I, but uh-oh, this one's a little bit tricky because looking at our key, we see three possible forms. It's either going to be masculine singular genitive, masculine singular dative, or masculine plural nominative. So how do we know which one it's going to be? Well, we have to use a little bit of logic, code breakers. I know you can do it. So first of all, let's leave those there and we'll decide which one it's going to be in just a minute. Let's see what teram is first. So looking at that am ending, thankfully we see that this one has only one option, feminine singular accusative. Okay, that's nice. That means that, remember, accusative is our code word for direct object. So we have a direct object, and we need to, now we just need to find a subject <laughs> and our verb. Let's look at our verb real quick. Why didn't? You see the NT there? That means it's plural. So let's look back at Natai and see which one it's going to be. So here's the thing. Sometimes to see whether or not your noun is going to be one of our three options here, you have to test it. And sometimes, even with that, testing it, you come up with multiple options that could be right answers. Then, we have to rely on that context that we talked about. Even more context than we've seen before, meaning other sentences that might be in the passage you're translating. So let's go through these and see which ones make sense. So one of the options for natai is masculine singular genitive. What happens if we make a genitive? Well then it's going to be a possessive noun adjective, probably modifying terang. That would mean we would have to use the pronoun they in our verb and translate it as, they see the sailors land. So that kind of makes sense, right? So that could be one of our options. That might be the right option. Let's try another option. What if it's masculine singular dative? All right, here's the thing with dative, indirect objects. You need special verbs to make indirect objects work. You can't just have any indirect object and direct object placed with any verb. You have to have specific verbs. And C is not one of those. It just doesn't make sense to have an, an, a noun indirectly receiving the action of seeing. So masculine singular dative is not going to work, so let's cross that one out. Our last option is masculine plural nominative. We add a few more sailors to the boat here. <laughs> what happens if we make it nominative? Well, that means that we re replace the pronoun they in they see and replace it with sailors, as in more than one. <laughs> That would make our translation, the sailors see the land. Okay, that also makes sense. So now we have two possible options. They see the sailors land or the sailors see the land. So once again, like I said, you'd have to rely on the context to decide which of these would actually be the right answer. 
If you were just talking about one little lonely sailor coming home and he see, they see the sailor's land, then that would make sense to use that one. But if you're talking about a group of sailors on a boat after a long voyage, finally saying land ho, then you would say the sailors see the land. In my opinion, that one seems a little more logical that you'd have a group of sailors on a boat seeing land. <laughs> so I, if it were me, then I would choose that option for translation. So just remember that there could be more than one option when it comes to translation, but just try to pick the most logical option. All right, we've done some practice in translation, and now we're moving on to a new declension, the second declension. Now, don't be overwhelmed. I know it looks like a whole nother declension, and it kind of is, but the cool thing is that a lot of things are similar. First of all, we get to keep all of our cases. Those stay the same for all declensions you will learn. The numbers stay the same, so you won't have to identify any random, I don't even know what other number it could be. The cool thing is that the endings are the only things that are changing. And so all we have to do is work on identifying those types of endings for specific nouns. The way you tell if a noun is in the second declension is by again looking at that genitive singular and looking for that little i with a macron over it. Remember that's that little line on top of it. And then that's also where you can find the stem. For this word, that would be port. So let's look at the rest of the second declension endings. We have us, e, it's pronounced like an e, it's kind of funny. O, um, o, e, orum, is, os, is. You see how many similarities there are with the first declension? It's actually not too bad. We have the eses that are the same, and the o that looks kind of like the a from the first declension. A good codebreaker knows how to look for the patterns. So keep your eye out. Let's see if we can decline filius filii, which means son. So we go to the genitive singular, just like first declension, take off that I with a macron, and we find philly. So we copy philly 10 times down this chart. Philly, 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 philly. <laughs> and then we can add on our second declension endings. Us, e, o, um, o, e, orum, is, os, is. And remember, the cool thing is that the, these endings are the only things that are changing. The way you translate them, the cases, and the numbers are all the same, just like the first declension. I think you're getting the hang of it. So far, we have two different families. First declension, which we identify with that AE, and then the second declension, which we identify with the I with a macron, right? Each of these declensions also has its own gender, basically. First declension is generally feminine, Remember that our one exception is if it names a job, then it's masculine. And these second declension nouns that we're learning right here are masculine. Some of them can be neuter, and we'll talk about that later. But for now, we're just identifying masculine second declension nouns. So let's practice identifying which family these nouns belong to. Our first word is Okeanus Okeani. Is this first declension or second declension? Well, looking at the genitive singular, we see that long I, the I with the macron, that would make it a second declension. And since so far we're just talking about masculine second declension nouns, here's a little hint, all the second declension nouns are going to be masculine. <laughs> so you can circle masculine as well. See, so this stuff is just gonna be pretty easy, so we can go down through this list pretty quickly. Our next word is Romanus, Romani. We see that I with a macron, so that makes it second declension and masculine. We are what we I, however, has that AE, which makes it first declension and then feminine. Why is it feminine? Remember, it's because we said that most first declension nouns are feminine unless they name a job. And last time I checked, road is not a job. Roma, Romai means Rome. We see that AE, so that's first declension, and since it doesn't name a job, it's feminine. Inopia, Inopii means scarcity or want. Also first declension, also feminine. And now we have Gladius, Gladii, which means sword. This is a cool word. But this one has an I with a macron at the end of its genitive singular, which makes it a second declension masculine noun. Murus muri means wall, also second declension masculine. Mundus mundi means world, second declension masculine again. See, there's a lot of patterns here. We're just looking for the patterns. Maria mariae means Mary, first declension because of the AE, and Mary is a woman. She has a natural gender, so we're just gonna stick with that. Maria Mariae is feminine. 
Last one, nata natai, means sailor. First declension, however, this one is not going to be feminine like most first declensions because sailor is naming an occupation, so it's going to be masculine. See, so identifying the declension of a noun and finding its gender is really not too difficult. So what we just did, identifying the declension and the gender, is really going to be helping with this part, identifying the forms. That just means, remember, that we're just finding all the possible forms it could be. Let's see if we can do it. Our first word is filios. To find the gender of a noun, we have to think back to our flashcard. What did you put on the flashcard for this word? We put filius filii, which has that I with the macron on it. Remember, like we just did, that means it's second declension, which also reminds us that it's masculine. So circle the M there. All right, now we have to find the number and the case, which we can do by looking at our key. The os is going to be plural and accusative. Accusative, remember, means direct object, so we'll translate this as the sons. Plural, remember? Next word, Romano. Okay, think back to the flashcard. We see Romanus, Romani. That has the I with the macron again, so it's going to be masculine. Now, what is the number and the case? Well, hang on, we have two options here. Thankfully, there are two blanks, <laughs> so we can write down both forms. One option is the singular dative, which we could translate as to or for the Roman. Our other option would be masculine singular ablative, which we might translate as by, with, or from the Roman. Kind of like we do when we're declining our noun, but just picking out a specific form. Now we have Christianus. What do we put on our card now? Christianus, Christiani. Also second declension, also masculine. What is the number in the case? Well, this one's pretty easy because it's on your flashcard as the singular nominative form. So we can translate the Christian or a Christian. What is Serwi? Well, that one you can kind of see the genitive singular form right there. <laughs> this one is going to be second declension, which means that it's masculine singular genitive, which we could translate as of the servant. Another option for translation would be masculine plural nominative. Don't forget that form on your key. That one could translate as just the servants because it's a plural and subject. Last word, gladiis. This one it was gladius, gladii, second declension, masculine. And looking at our key, we see one option as plural dative and the other option as masculine plural ablative. So the dative form could be to or for the swords, and then the ablative form by, with, from the swords. Great job, guys. Okie dokie, guys, we're going back to translating from Latin to English, or code breaking as we like to call it. This time, however, we're going to have a little bit of a mix of first declension and second declension nouns, so be on guard, code breakers. Don't let the length of the sentence overwhelm you. We're going to go one word at a time. Identify one word at a time. Our first word is agricola. And we can see in our word bank, agricola, agricolae, farmer. What declension is this? First declension, we see that A-E. And this word right here, because it means farmer, is an occupation, so it's going to be masculine. Now, what is that ending? Let's look at our key. And we see masculine, singular, nominative. So that means we have a subject. Great. Our next word is serum. Ooh. All right, what is this word? Well, look down at your word bank. Do you see it? Servus, servi, slave. So that means that this is going to be a second declension noun because we have that I with the macron on it. And that also means it's going to be masculine. So it's going to be masculine. And then what is the number in the case? Look at your key. We see singular and accusative direct object. So we have a subject and a direct object. Now all we have to do is check the verb and make sure it matches with our subject. So do you see the T there? No NT, just a T. Remember that shows us that it's singular. Our subject was singular, so that means the subject and the verb match. So agricola or farmer is going to be doing the action of sees. He, she, it sees. So we'll translate this as the farmer sees the slave. Awesome. 
fantastic work, Codebreakers. Subscribe for more videos if you want to keep codebreaking alongside me. If you haven't already, download the free worksheet that goes along with this video and purchase the at-home worksheets to further enhance your Latin experience. Keep watching for more codebreaking fun. Give me a thumbs up if you liked it. See you next time.